Okay, greetings. Well, I'm getting some reverb. Is that coming from me? Oh, that's good. That's better. Okay. Yes, well, greetings. Welcome, everyone. I want to invite folks who are in the way back to come on in if you want to. Come on up front a little bit further. Uh, we have handouts on the tables. Um, there's also a one-page sheet of citations that I'll refer to um, as we move through. Maybe, uh, Sarah, would you bring me one of those one-pagers? Perfect, yeah. Um, we are... We are in, in uh, our session 11 of our class. Yes, woohoo, we made it. I can't believe, right? Session 11 of our class, Turned Upside Down, the Story of the Reformations. We've been uh, tracking along uh, from the fall, and of course, we've had a few breaks here and there. Uh, next week, I want to let you know that we will have class. I'll be out of town, but uh, Lisa Johnson is going to come and do a presentation on art during this period, during the 16th century, 17th century. So, and she'll be doing some uh, presentations on both Protestant expressions and Catholic expressions because there was a huge kind of outburst uh, in both directions, really, uh, from, from the Reformation visions of uh, different traditions. So you won't want to miss that. All right, well, let me uh, pray for us before we get started, and then we can move forward into our discussion. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for worship. We thank you that you came to be in our midst and that you continue to be here by the power of your spirit. And we pray that your spirit is present among us, awakening us, empowering us, and loving us, helping us to love and to be loved. We ask and pray now as we go and look back that you help us to learn from both the good and the bad. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, interestingly, and oh, Andrew, are you going to join us? <laughs> um, interestingly enough, yes, uh, session 11, uh, we have traveled through uh, very, uh, uh, I think I've gotten through five different reforming visions at this point. Uh, remember, we started out with an explanation of why this is called the story of the Reformations, in plural, and that's because there were differing Reformation visions, and that the call for reform was one that was deeply rooted in the Catholic tradition already. There were calls for reform up to 400 years prior to Luther's attempt at reforming. So we talked about Martin Luther and the German Reformation, we then switched and went a little further south and talked about Zwingli and his work in the city of Zurich, which was sort of the beginning of the Swiss Reformation. We talked about um, the radical reformers who in many ways began in Zurich in part as a protest against some of what Zwingli was doing. Then we talked about the Reformation of the Commons, which was found its particular expression in the Peasants' War, the German Peasants' War, and we kind of unpacked uh, what that means and what it doesn't mean. And then now we are transitioning to talk about um, Calvin, and we've been talking actually about Calvin, probably more than I should have been talking about Calvin. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, this is a figure I think that's particularly germane to us in part because of all the reforming visions that we have talked about and will be able to talk about in our class, Calvin is the one who most directly influences our church tradition. So the church tradition of congregationalism is very much shaped by impulses coming out of Calvin's thought as it's mediated into the English context. Now, um, last week, a couple weeks ago, I had had a chance to introduce you to young man Calvin, remind you that he's not Swiss, he's French. He starts out wanting to study law, or at least his parents do. He eventually falls in love with the humanist scholarship, and himself, I think, wanted to just become a humanist scholar, but things kind of, history intervened. He gets embroiled in a controversial uh, speech given in the city of Paris and gets kicked out. He has to go into exile. 
And he's on the run for two or three years. Um, at one point during that time, he winds up staying with a very wealthy, like, baroness, I believe. Um, I'm not sure. I can't remember her name. But she was known to have an extraordinary library. And it was during that time that he begins to work on his book, The Institutes. And so his first, um, the first edition of The Institutes comes out in part during that time. He, as he's on the run, he winds up uh, coming into the city of Geneva, uh, probably going to stay there for a weekend. And uh, he winds up being accosted, I think is the best way to say it, by a figure in the city of Geneva, a man named William Farrell, who is already trying to bring about a Protestant-style reformation in the city. And Farrell had heard about um, uh, the Institutes. And he's like, the author of the Institutes is in Geneva. This is a sign from God. And so he runs and, and finds him. And Calvin begs off and says, I don't want to help you. <laughs> I don't want to stay here. I'm glad that the Institutes are helping you. Please leave me alone. Farrell says no to that. He says, look, if you don't help, this city, would, in its dire need of, of, of help in this time of crisis, if you don't help the truth to come here, may you be cursed. And Calvin takes that pretty seriously and decides to stay. He does stay. He's in Geneva for about two years, I think, or so, maybe two and a half years, before he gets kicked out of, kicked out of Geneva. Uh, always fun, right? Love to talk about Calvin get kick, kicked out of town from time to time. You don't normally think about that when you think about Calvin. And basically, it's over who is going to have authority in the realm of the church, who is going to have authority, by which I mean who is going to be in charge of actually reforming the church. Is it going to be the city government, the magistrates, the powerful families, or is it going to be sort of the church employees, we might say, the pastors, et cetera? And um, Calvin is arguing that it should that the church should really be in charge of reforming itself as opposed to submitting itself to the city to be reformed. Um, so he winds up getting, getting kicked out. So then uh, last week we talked about his coming back. He comes back. There's also some external politics actually that leads to Calvin being expelled from Geneva. Uh, the city of Geneva at the time is caught between the pressures of the city of Bern and the kingdom of Savoy. Eventually that goes away, and the city council folks are like, hey, we need to invite these people back because we want the reformation, the reform that they were talking about. So Calvin goes back, even though he doesn't want to. I shared with you some of the uh, letter exchanges. You know, his public exchanges are very cordial. I would love to help you. His private letter was, uh, it would be like being crucified if I went back there. So he was not as interested and going back, but he does. Yes. In the 1530s. 1517. This is second generation of Reformation. You know, this is, so I have kind of a conversation and we sort of talk through Calvin as a second generation reformer. Luther dies, to give you a sense, Luther dies in the 1540s. Um, but he's silent. He's not writing a lot in the 1530s. So I talked a little bit about some of that. Um, and, and Calvin himself doesn't die until the 1560s. So Calvin comes back uh, in the late 1530s, I think it is, um, and uh, has a pretty contentious um, stay there. Now, before I talked about him coming back, we talked about probably the most essential idea, certainly the most influential for good or bad that Calvin uh, crafts, which is his theology of double predestination, his particular expression of that. And I uh, walk through sort of the dynamic and the, the logic that Calvin is working with, the deep um, things that he wants to affirm, um, and whether or not we would agree with him or not, we kind of left that open, of course. Um, and I made lots of snide comments to that effect. <laughs> and I got, a, I got a text from my dad. Um, anyway, <laughs> I love you, Dad. All right. Anyway, then, then I talked a little bit about the controversy of his second stay. And a lot of it really revolves around, it does revolve around certainly social power, um, 
but it but it sort of the most um, straightforward thing that it revolves around is the power of the what, what came to be called the consistory, and the consistory was a body of elders um, and pastors who oversaw public morals, and they had the power to excommunicate. Uh, and for Calvin, as you're going to see in just a minute, that was a very important power because the way that he thought about the Lord's Supper. Well, the consistory could excommunicate you for any number of things. And I shared with you a couple of quotes. Uh, I think I told you that they've been publishing the consistory registers um, in English over the last several years. And I happen to have one of the probably, I don't know, five or seven volumes. And I just pulled that out and kind of picked out a couple of juicy quotes. One of the, which was by, about a woman named Donna Jane Peterman. And I really love that because it sounds like a political ad the way it starts. Donna Jane Peterman, she doesn't go to her church, she goes to other churches. Should she be allowed to have communi communion or not? And ultimately, as you read through that quote, you see that Donna Jane Peterman believes the Reformation theology goes to church regularly, but, but she doesn't go to her parish church, she gets excommunicated. Now, excommunication, remember, is a tool that is meant to draw people back, so it's not meant to be permanent. But you could see this application. There were also, of course, I talked about the episode of a very wealthy family um, hosting a marriage ceremony in which, at which there is dancing. And there's a lot of trouble there because there's not supposed to be any dancing going on in Geneva. So that's the power struggle, right? It, are these clerics, you know, in their cowls going to be allowed to tell the rich and wealthy and powerful people what to do or not? And I think that's kind of what uh, the consistory stories uh, highlight. We, talk, we talked also about the two most important um, episodes, we might say, um, that give you a sense of the stakes uh, from Calvin's perspective and probably from the people of Geneva's perspective. Uh, we talked about Jerome Balsic and Michael Servetus, um, and they, at differing angles, um, had objections. Uh, Balsic's objections, I think, are pretty straightforward. He objects to Calvin's theology of predestination and says that it makes God the author of sin. Uh, and many people agree with Balsic, but because he had the temerity to challenge Calvin, who was in charge, he's, he is exiled from the city. He's lucky, because Michael Servetus is burned at the stake. And Michael Servetus, uh, and I talked through that episode as well, right, he denies the Trinity. And he's, this guy's a, a polymath genius. He's a physician mathematician, scientist, and theologian, Spanish theologian. And, uh, and he had a long-running um, correspondence, actually, with Calvin, going back into the 1530s. Well, he winds up getting into trouble with Catholic authorities, and for some reason, even to this day, scholars do not know why Michael Servetus went to Geneva, because he would have known that the Genevans did not like him. So immediately he shows up in town, he gets arrested, Eventually, he gets executed, even though it was not a part of Geneva law that you could execute people. You could only exile them. But because of Catholic authority saying this man should be ex executed, the Genevans decide, Genevan city government decides, we have to show that we're just as strong as, ca as the Catholics with heresy, and they burn him at the stake. Those two episodes give you a real clear sense of... Um, what's at stake and some of the dynamics um, that would have played out on the ground in a city like Geneva. All right, so today what I want to do is conclude our discussion of Calvin by talking a little bit about his vision of the church. And the purpose for doing this is I think, number one, I want to end on a more positive note. I think that there are some really remarkable things to take from Calvin in, say, his theology of the Lord's Supper over against his theology of predestination. But I also want to say that I think the key to the success, the, the really profound success that Calvin and Calvinism goes on to have, uh, 
in some measure has to do with the way that Calvin structured church life. Um, and I like to say that he basically McDonaldized, right? So McDonald, so he basically creates a franchise model that can be more easily replicated because there are no bishops needed, right? And that's one of the things about this tradition that's different uh, than some of the other uh, Protestant reforming traditions. So Reformed Church order, the first thing, first and foremost to note is that for Calvin, um, the Lord's Supper is at the center. I think this surprises a lot of people because they think the sermon is at the center, but that's actually a later development. For Calvin, it's really the Lord's Supper that's at the center of worship. And in fact, he argues that it should be celebrated every time Christians come together, um, which at the time would have been radical because the Catholic Church only celebrated uh, the Lord's Supper for all the laity twice a year. So later on, Catholic practice establishes every time you get together, and the, and, the, and the Genevan people did not agree with Calvin, and they said, okay, we'll only do it, you know, once a quarter or once a month. So the Lord's Supper itself is at the center of church life, and therefore it is the mechanism, it becomes the mechanism, effectively, by which the community can be disciplined. So order and discipline go together for Calvin. Now, his theology of the Lord's Supper, in a sense, is a, we might say, splitting of the difference between Luther and Zwingli. Now, I talked a few weeks back uh, about Luther's approach to the Lord's Supper and Zwingli's approach to the Lord's Supper. Calvin basically rejects both of these and offers a third option. And what we might say is in common is that Calvin doesn't think what does or doesn't happen to the elements, that that's not the main point of the Lord's Supper. And so he sees both of these positions as trying to deal with that question, and he thinks that's not the right question to deal with. So let me say this very quickly then. He rejects Luther and the Catholic tradition by arguing that Christ is not physically or bodily present in the elements of the bread and the wine. The, Ca the Catholic tradition had sought to deal with this through the theology of transubstantiation, which basically means that the substance of the bread is transformed into the body of Jesus, and the substance of the wine is transformed. That's where the transubstantiation part comes from. Calvin rejects this. Um, he also, though, rejects Luther's attempt because Luther still is interested in saying that the, the body of Jesus is present. It's just that it's in, with, and under. Like alongside of the substance of the bread comes the substance of Jesus' flesh, his, his body. For Calvin, both of these are kind of a mistake, and it's too much Aristotle. You know, you're using too much Greek philosophy to, to answer a question on a certain level that is a mystery. The point then is that, as I say here, it's not just what happens in the elements that makes the Lord's Supper important. What does he mean by that? He means that it is the act of getting up, of coming forward, saying prayers together, hearing scripture together, forgiving and receiving forgiveness those things constitute the real importance of the meal. The meal is all of those things together. It's not just what happens to a piece of bread and a cup of wine. And he wants to move away from that. He, however, at the same time, rejects Zwingli. Because Zwingli says, well, this is only a memorial meal. Zwingli also rejects the idea that Jesus is bodily present. But he says, all we're really doing is remembering Jesus. And Calvin says, no, that's not quite enough. Jesus is truly present by the power of the Spirit. He may not be bodily present, but he is truly present. That's kind of the language that Calvin typically likes to use. So by the power, in the power of the Spirit, Jesus is truly present. And Calvin goes on to develop this really profound Trinitarian account of what happens. And what he says basically can be boiled down to, in the, in the participation of the supper, 
you and I are being invited in to the love that constitutes Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Their life of love that they share with one another, that is shared with us in and through the, through, through the Lord's Supper. That's sort of Calvin's vision, which is quite, I think, beautiful. Now, there are three things that Calvin likes to emphasize in the supper, aside from what we've already said. The first is <clears throat> that the supper both gives us something now, but it also points to the future. So this is the already and the not yet. In the supper, we truly are encountered by Jesus. We are truly fed spiritually by Jesus who is present in the spirit. And thus he likes to talk about um, uh, reinforcing or making possible our union with Christ. He'll use this language of union with Christ, um, which maybe sounds a little more strange to modern ears. Um, at the same time, though, Calvin knows, you know, that we live in anticipation of the final end. And so for him, the supper isn't just this moment I'm being united with Christ. It also points away from itself to the final great banquet, right, that we hear about in Isaiah 25 or that we see at the end of the book of Revelation of the coming together, of feasting together, that sense of a vision. Uh, is what Calvin likes to, to emphasize in terms of the not yet. So already we receive and encounter Jesus or shaped by Jesus, and yet we know there's something more, there's something fuller that this supper is pointing us towards. The second key dynamic is that it is in the Lord's Supper that we get to renew our bonds of love, both for God but also with one another. Right? We are bound together, and the supper, in a sense, and this, I think, picks up on the more ancient notions, out of Hebrew notions of eating. You only ate with people that you were close with. You only ate with people whom you trusted, or you were trying to develop a, um, a treaty of some type, and you might have a meal. So to eat with someone else is a very intimate thing, an expression of solidarity, uh, and also love. So in the Lord's Supper, then, as I say here, the congregation has a chance to reaffirm its commitment to one another. And this happens, of course, not just by consuming the bread and the wine. It happens in all those other things that are going on around the supper, right? The giving and receiving of forgiveness, the saying of prayers together, hearing the preached word. That is a, this is a space where the community is being knit together, right? So it's an intimate moment, all right? The last thing is that for Calvin, this is the place in the Christian life where we most clearly see the coincidence of faith and obedience. Now, this is Calvin's perspective, okay? So remember, for Calvin, we are saved by faith, and he's so concerned of being too Catholic, you know, that he, he develops a whole theology of predestination. So he wants to make clear that it is faith or trust in God. That's what saves us. That's what makes us whole. God doesn't owe us anything. Rather, it's grace. And yet, Calvin is also deeply concerned with how we live our lives. Obviously, that would be the case, or you wouldn't have something called the consistory, right? Getting up in your business, you know? So... Obedience is also significant for him. So in a sense, he believes that it is in participating in the Lord's Supper that our faith, our trust in God, in Jesus, in the promises of God, in the presence of Jesus, in the here and now, we also are being obedient by standing up and moving forward. Actually, participating in it is itself an act of obedience. So the coincidence of faith and obedience for him this is the site where it most readily occurs simultaneously, and it's hard to discern what is faith and what is obedience because they're both so uh, intimately bound together. Okay. Now, Calvin, you have sort of the theology here in which you see, I mean, you could describe this as a Eucharistic spirituality, like a spirituality shaped by the Lord's Supper. Um, that's the way he thinks about this. If you were going to talk about 
I mean, when I was in seminary, I would go, I, I sometimes would have, um, oh, I, I, what is it called? Anyway, I worked part-time from time to time <laughs> for Fidelity Investments. And uh, I went down and uh, I pushed paper. Don't, you didn't want me adding up numbers. I wasn't doing that, so don't worry. I pretty much was like, I'd have to fill out something, you know, or whatever. And I was getting paid, you know, probably not, not much more than minimum wage. Um, but it was a job, and I was very happy to have it. And sometimes on, during, during lunch, instead of having lunch, I would go to a local Episcopal cathedral, and I would participate in the Lord's Supper because I felt like it fed me. That is what I think Calvin, in a way, is imagining about the Lord's Supper, that we, it, it is being taken often and frequently, so frequent that it might happen every day of the week, not just on Sunday, all right? If that's how highly he holds it, then you can understand how he would view it as a very powerful thing to say that someone is barred from it, right? And so that's why when I talk about the sort of the discipline com component, uh, that's really, I think, sort of the motor behind it. So Calvin argues it should be celebrated frequently. The Genevan community never ultimately agrees with him. He never is able to move to that, but that is always what he articulates. But it does become sort of a site, a place where discipline can be ensured um, and uh, maintained. And that typically happens under the heading, are you rightly partaking of the Lord's Supper? And rightly partaking, and this is sort of the, uh, what is it, everything in order, <laughs> right and in order. I think that's sort of the Presbyterian phrase. Um, that's, it kind of comes a little bit out of this. But what does it mean to rightly partake? Well, first and foremost, it means to be living an ethical life. So... If you live in a small city, and Geneva's not that big, only about 10,000 people, and that, of course, excludes all the refugees that are flowing in there, chances are pretty good that people know what you do and don't do, right? So if you're, um, if you're not kind of upholding that civic virtue, they're going to know. And if they know, you're going to be barred from taking communion that week. The reason, from Calvin's perspective, I'll, 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 I will pause in just a minute. The reason from Calvin's perspective for this is that he believed that if someone was wrongly partaking, it actually didn't just, they weren't just condemning themselves by participating in the Lord's Supper. They were potentially condemning the entire community because the entire community was not policing its purity. That's sort of the vision that he has. And you can kind of hear the, the echoes of... Puritanism here, right? And the Puritan tradition comes out of precisely out of Calvin. So uh, that's kind of the end component. Let me just give you a couple more comments, and then I'll stop and take some questions from, from all of you before we uh, transition. I think we, yeah, we're going to transition into the last thing about Calvin. So the sermon also, of course, is important in a Calvinist uh, vision of the church. Um, it is central, and from Calvin's perspective, the word always had to be preached when the sacrament was um, administered. The reason for that is that there were, there were several reasons, but if we're just talking about it sacramentally, is that one has to explain what is going on in participating in this ritual. Right? That would be the most basic idea. So the sermon or the word should always accompany the sacrament. And so you hear this talk about word and sacrament. Uh, and this, of course, also has deep echoes in the Catholic tradition. In addition to this, then, Calvin develops a structure um, for the life of a community whereby it can order itself and, and then he, you know, they kind of ship this out, essentially. They kind of, this vision. And each of the church orders or church positions that you're going to hear has correlated connect, or connected to it an institutional expression. And that institutional expression could be just in the church or it might be broader depending on where you are. So the pastors 
These are the folks who are um, commissioned to do pastoral oversight, to preach the gospel. They are called the company of pastors. So there's typically more than one. And a company of pastors, what, what is that meant to do? It's not like a gaggle of geese. That was funny. I thought that was funny, but it didn't work. Um, <laughs> you guys are like, no, no, that's too dad joke. That's too much dad. Uh, I wish Jonah was here. He would, he would really shake his head. Um, so what does the company do? It, it is meant to provide both support for other pastors as well as oversight of other pastors, right, to keep them from um, overstepping their bound. Next, you have the doctors or the teachers. And I told you, right, Calvin is the first teaching minister in our tradition, and that's why at the very least I have to tip my hat to him because I'm the teaching minister. Well, the doctors, what's their role? Their role is to teach. So pastors preach, doctors teach, um, and particularly lecture, and they might be connected then to a school or an academy. Uh, the academy is what it comes to be called in Geneva. Then you have uh, the elders, and the elders are essentially ruling. They're called, typically called ruling elders because they make major decisions in the life of the church sometimes budgetary, but oftentimes their primary duty is to help oversee church and public morals. And so the consistory is typically aligned with the elders, even though pastors will also often sit on a consistory. The elders are also typically, certainly in the city of Geneva, drawn from the most powerful families. So there is a kind of integrating of the state and the church that happens in that place, uh, in, at least in Calvin's vision. Then lastly, we have the deacons, right, those who serve. And uh, in the context of Geneva, they, they, their institutional expression was the hospital. There were, I think there were at least two hospitals in the city of Geneva that, that the Protestants take over from Catholic, that had formerly been run by Catholic nuns and monks. So the hospital then becomes, and a hospital is here kind of what you would think it might be in the 16th century, right? Overseeing the sick, the infirm, also those though who need food, et cetera. So it might go beyond what we typically think. What is not here? No bishops, right? There is no need for a bishop. There is no need to, to create, have a bishop who has oversight of a certain district, et cetera. So some of the hierarchy component um, Calvin just lops off, and he basically creates a church order structure that can easily be replicated in one place, right? And you're going to see in just a minute how effective this is. Lastly, then, I want to say pretty much after the uh, events with Servetus, uh, et cetera, Calvin is able to consolidate the Reformation uh, in the city of Geneva uh, from 1555 to 1564. Um, he is able to bring in a bit of uh, uh, stability, we might say. The, the consistory winds, uh, becomes much more uh, clearly functioning. Uh, the educational system is taken over and, and by this point in time dominated by the ministers. Um, they also, of course, take over uh, poor relief, um, and in 1559, um, and basically the last five years or so of Calvin's life, he is not well. Uh, so in 1559, he publishes the final edition of his Institutes, which is at this point a two-volume uh, document, and it will become the most important Protestant document, I think, produced during this era. And the way that Calvin envisions it, I think, is as a manual for pastors, right? He's, he's imagining that this is a tool for pastors um, wherever they are. You know, if they can't get education or if they've had education before, uh, here is an additional tool to use. All right, let me stop and see what kind of comments, questions. Um, I, I think Elaine is right behind you, Mark. So this is probably obvious. Um, 
but coming from a Catholic background, I'm questioning. So he gets rid of confession and individual absolution and replaces it with public oversight and whatever. Well, you're in the weeds for me on that one. I don't know for sure, actually. Yeah, we don't, you don't have an office of confession like you do in the Catholic tradition. Um, but even, I feel like I'm, tr I'm treading on ground because we're assuming that modern Catholic practices were actually being done back then, and I'm not sure yet that they were. I just don't know. So I'm not sure how to answer that question. It's a good question. Excuse me. Hold on, hold on, Jeff. I'm right behind you. There's a microphone. Uh, what was Calvin's position in the church or the community or from whatever to start formulating all of these things? You know, who elected him king? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's he's invited by the city council uh, to come back. And uh, and he and Pharrell take up uh, the mantle as pastor and teacher. And in that in those days, pastor had carried an awful lot of weight. You couldn't just fire him like you can today. No, he had been. Well, no, you're asking me questions because you missed the last episode. I can't believe this, Jeff. Yeah, so he had been traveling around and had been in exile and was invited by the current, one of the current pastors, Pharrell, to help reform the city. He creates a document, the 1537 memorandum, that's going to outline a little bit of this. And ultimately, the city council rejects it. And they kick Calvin and Pharrell out of town. They kick them out of the city. He goes to Strasbourg. And there he's, I think he's there for two or three years. He, and this is, that's the first place where he really becomes a pastor. Because when he came on board with Pharrell, he came on board only as a lecturer, as a teacher. So it's in Strasbourg that he learns about pastoral life, etc. While he's there, he is then courted again by the Geneva City Council to come back. So they have invested in him power to do this. And so there's lots of ins and outs, you know, like you can imagine on a city council. If it's dominated by wealthy families, they're not all going to see eye to eye. And so you can imagine sort of the politics of that. That's okay. They've got, yeah, it's all there. It's all, it's on the ram. Other questions? Ross has a question, looks like. So, um, one of the outgrowths of Calvinism, uh, as I understand it, was what we've wound up calling, and I bring this up because of my political conservatism, uh, the Protestant ethic and the behaviors that are all connected with that. And I know that that uh, swishes into uh, prosperity theology and all kinds of stuff we don't want to go to. But Protestant ethic, kind of, we, there's a transition someplace along the line from right behavior to love wins. And behavior becomes no longer an issue. It's all just love and I you know I grew up reading the Proverbs and you know if you want good outcomes in your life or the whole Old Testament behave a certain way and so to me behaving a certain way is an important thing and I would like to see more of the linkage back to our ancestry do you have a question in here somewhere, Russ? And stop. Did you have a question? I don't know if you did. 
Well, I think that actually there's push and pull all along the way. And, and even folks who say love wins would not say that, you know, behavior doesn't matter. Um, I think particularly of someone like John Wesley, uh, who said that he was but a hair's breadth from Calvinism, um, who very much emphasizes the goodness and love of God. Um, so in terms of just the genealogy that you offer, we, I'd probably push back a little bit on some of that, but I appreciate your, your comment. Other, any other comments before I, we're going to do our last portion on, of Calvin and then transition into the Catholic Reformation. All right, let me do that. I don't want to take too much time because I want to try and do as much as I can to introduce to you some of the dynamics of the Catholic Reformation. The, the, what I really wanted to conclude with was uh, the really pretty profound spread of Calvinism. Um, of all the movements we've talked about, they are probably the most successful in terms of spreading into new areas. I think it's fair to say that Lutheranism um, is a dominantly German language expression. Calvinism comes to be expressed in Swiss German, French, Dutch, English. You know, it kind of goes uh, Hungarian. There's even a Hungarian wing. Um, and so it, it spread, in, or a Czech, a Czech wing as well, yeah. So it spreads much more diversely than, say, the Luther's vision. And the, the Anabaptists also spread, but they're not as successful. And so I think that's why kind of the success is sort of interesting. So let me just kind of give you three areas. The first is in France. So if you've heard of the Huguenots, in a sense, that's the French Reformed, the French Calvinists. So in 1554, right, there is not a single organized church, a single organized Calvinist church in France. Within 10 years, there's like seven or 800. So you can see here, 1562, seven to 800 such churches. During the 1560s, the Huguenot population come, becomes 10% of the French population. And there's an entire sort of interesting story around kind of wars of religion in France and uh, French Catholics versus French Huguenots. Extraordinary growth, if you look at that. The Low Countries, what we would call Holland today. Geneva is not quite as important for this. The city of Emden actually plays more of a role but by 1566, Protestantism has really prevailed in the Low Countries. Um, and, and that will, of course, lead to later developments. I think I talked last time, actually, about uh, Arminius and Arminianism. But the kind of Protestantism also that really is um, more dominant is probably the Calvinist version over against the German Lutheran version though there certainly are early German Lutheran attempts to spread Protestantism into this, this area. Dutch Calvinism, of course, goes on to have a much longer life. If you're familiar with the Reformed Church in America or the Christian Reformed Church, it's Christian Reformed, isn't it? Um, uh, those are Dutch Calvinist expressions. And then in Scotland, um, so Presbyterianism, uh, as we know, it comes out of this. So Scotland uh, has a long and kind of complex story, a meandering tale in some ways. Starts in 1540s. Uh, the figure John Knox is very instrumental in this, and he's an interesting, complicated guy. Um, his, you can see his dates here. He is actually exiled to Geneva and spends some time in Geneva in the 1550s. Uh, writing pamphlets, and uh, he actually gets into trouble for some of his pamphlets from Calvin because they're so kind of vituperous and, and, and kind of vicious. Uh, well, he goes back, eventually helps to ingrain this uh, reformed Calvinist vision, and then after his death, Presbyterianism, which becomes the Scottish expression, really becomes more becomes sort of the dominant expression of Christianity in Scotland. Not the only one by any means, but certainly. So these are three significant areas. We could talk about the Hungarian and, and the Czech as well, if we brought those in. 
Why, though, is Calvinism so successful? And I want to argue, I offer to you sort of five interconnecting reasons, I think. The first is the initiating character of the Reformation in Geneva. And, that, and what I mean by that is the multilingual origin, right? Geneva itself is cosmopolitan. It has Swiss influences. It has French influences. It has Italian influences. It also is a refugee city, taking in populations that, are, that speak different languages. Calvin himself is not a native Swiss speaker, Swiss German speaker. He's French. So that multilingual origin, which you would think obviously can be challenging, is also potentially a great benefit because you can talk to more people. You can be in contact with more people. You, there's chances if someone wrote you from Hungary that there might be someone in your city who can read the letter. Right? I mean, that's important. The second thing is the word and education. Culture of the word here refers both to scripture but also to education. And I think it would be fair to say that one of the driving impulses of this form of, of reformation is the idea that people need to know what they believe. They need to actually understand what it is that they're confessing and saying that they're committed to. Um, and so they need to be educated. We need to help them learn to read. We need to get writings into their hands. And what we see in Geneva is that happening in a pretty remarkable way. I mean, I think I just this is just one little factoid that in a 10-year period, 130 different printers move into the city of Geneva. And you can imagine what they're able to put out. Bibles, hymnals, theological tracts. And this stuff is really sophisticated. So the more sophisticated arguments... Um, you have, the more able you are to defend yourself over against your opponent. And, of course, this is a time of serious acrimony, so people are going back and forth at each other. Number third is connected to number two, and that is who is going to be the most interested in getting an education? People who have some money. And so this is a time when we start to see middling classes and, and uh, kind of come into emergence. The most of this movement is also, the, and I'm speaking here of Calvinism, is also in urban areas. So it's not a hyper-rural uh, phenomenon. But this emphasis on education then is going to attract these new middling classes. And once you attract the middling classes, you're attracting the business people and people of some means, and also, therefore, probably people who have some say in how their community is going to be run, etc. So you can see why that would be successful, right? You win over people who already have power and they become your allies, and it's more than likely that this is going to go forward. Keep, in keeping with this idea of culture of the word, education, writing, is the fact that Calvin was a phenomenal letter writer. There are some 4,200 letters in his correspondence. That's letters both that he received, but also letters that he sent. And uh, they go, there's a, I have a book actually on the kind of the culture of Calvinism, and they have this fabulous map where they show the letters and where they go, and it just spins out in a spiral. You know, they're not just going to one area, going all over the place. So his personal interaction with people, right, you could imagine how that would go a long way um, as people were trying to figure out how do we, how do we embody this Reformation vision, and then lastly, what I just talked about, church structure. That church structure is pretty easy to replicate in a given place. You have four offices. They're all localized. You could get by with three. You don't have to have a teacher. Don't tell anyone I said that. But, but you could. And you don't need a bishop. You could do this on your own. And one of the differences between Calvin and Luther is that people sometimes would write them and they would say, look, there's no church near me. There's no Protestant church. Can I go to the Catholic service? And Luther would say, yes, you can go to the Catholic service. You can maintain your faith and participate. Calvin would say, no, do not go. It's idolatry. 
And if you, if you get that language out of Calvin, then it's going to give you all the more impetus to want to found your own community, right? Um, his lines are, are much, the, the lines are drawn much um, more in black, much stronger. Okay, the Catholic Reformation in eight minutes or less. Let's do it. Any, any concluding comments, questions that folks might have? Anyone online? Looks like Elgin's hanging out there. All right. Okay, well, I'll move us ahead then. The last uh, reforming movement we're going to be able to engage uh, in our class, there would there is one more that we could have gotten to, but unfortunately our time is going to run out uh, because we're having, we're having all these multiple uh, meetings uh, as a church, which are good. Uh, but we just can't continue uh, our story. But our last movement, our last reforming vision is the Catholic Reformation. And um, one of the things to note before I start is that many of you probably in your head are thinking, no, that's the Counter-Reformation. And I want to dispel you of that, if I can. Um, first thing I want to note is that the historiography, which would be sort of the, the, the historical work that's gone into describing what these thing, what these events are, has been pretty problematic from the beginning. And you can imagine, because if you were a Protestant, you were talking about the Reformation from your perspective, and who are the bad guys? The Catholics. And if you were a Catholic and you were writing about the Protestant Refor or the, the Reformation, who are the bad guys? The Protestant. So the acrimony of theology spreads into historiography, and they tell the story in a way that is ultimately distorting. Um, the, as I mentioned there, right, uh, early studies are highly polemical, and they always place the Roman Catholic Church as the problem. That is the problem that needs to be reformed. And that's true to a certain extent. But it's very important, and this is why I started out with this at the very beginning, to say that calls for reform come out of the Catholic tradition. And they don't just come from the margins, they come from the center. There are popes and cardinals and bishops calling for reform of the church. So many Catholic church, many Catholic figures, in my, my notes it says, many loyal sons and daughters of the church who remain that way also want reform. The question is, what kind of reform? Is it the reform of doctrine which, of course, as you can tell from our engagement with Luther and Calvin and others, they're going to argue yes. Or is it primarily a reform of practices? Um, and, and that is going to be somewhat the direction that we, that we will find if we, get, if we follow this narrative through. So what is important then in light of this? First of all, this is not simply a counter-reformation. It's a reformation, Right? Catholic reforms are not just attempts to respond to Protestants. These are basically, they've finally gotten around to doing some business that they should have been doing for the past 250 or 300 years. And they put it that way oftentimes. Right? Reform is a long-standing thing that goes back at least to the 13th century. And we have to remind ourselves that the world, in the meantime, has changed. Uh, right? I, I started out with that observation in pre-1517. Now things have changed. So there is going to be some responding, but it's not primarily driven, I think, simply by response. Now, the first thing I want to note for you is how did the um, Catholic Church early on respond to the different reforming movements? Then we're gonna talk about the two key expressions of the Catholic Reformation. Um, one of the most common responses was to see what was happening with Luther and others as simply another expression of heresy. And there's a long line of medieval heresies that the church had had to deal with. Now, if you go back in and you really look at some of this, you will see that things are awfully complicated around those issues. But this was a dominant ca uh, category, 
is this is just another expression of heresy. Um, uh, you know, and these heretics have to be dealt with because heresy is not just wrong opinion. It might actually lead, lead someone to jeopardize their soul. So they often saw them as spiritual serial killers, which is the language that I took from another scholar. Remember that everyone in this regard took heresy seriously. So Protestants are not arguing that, you know, we should just allow anything. In fact, they're arguing just as intensely that they're right and everybody else is wrong as uh, the Catholic Church is. Right? So there's no argument here for toleration, per se. We're a long way from that. What do we see, though, in the, the pamphlets that they do produce? And there's not a lot of them early on, in part because how do you deal with heresy? If you start talking to heretics, you legitimate them, Right? So you probably probably best to ignore them for a little bit, maybe talk to them a little bit. And then once Luther is really declared a heretic, well, then the issue settled. I don't even need to talk to this person anymore. And so there's a kind of, if you look at the printing, for instance, this is a period of explosion of printing, but like something like five-sixths of all materials printed is pro-reform. Um, and the reason for that, again, is because if we talk to them, then we're legitimating them. But what were some of the arguments? Well, the most, one of the most straightforward one, ones was that Luther was an arrogant fool, believing that he, was, he had finally come along and fixed everything that had been wrong for thousands of years. Thank you very much, Luther. You're not that smart. And the argument was that, uh, as, as I say here, precedent is to civil laws, custom is to church law. Well, certain customs... The customs that Luther wants to throw out, customs connected to things like purgatory or confession, etc. Maybe we can't find precisely in Scripture where it is, but we've been using this for so long that we need to accept it because that's precedent, right? And who are you to say that we should change? And, of course, this also is predicated on the belief that the Spirit has not abandoned the church, Um no, the Spirit is still with the church, guiding the church in its life, living out its life, etc. They uh, made an argument, an exegetical argument, based on the idea that Scripture talks about things that are not written down. That's the, like, when you can find this right in Jewish tradition, the written Torah and the oral Torah. The same thing here, right? Written Scripture, oral Scripture, or something like that, oral custom, takes on that same kind of function. The historical argument is that there is a time in which the Bible doesn't exist, but there's still a church, right? I mean, the, the, the canon, and the, what they're talking about here is the canon of Scripture. And, of course, all Protestants are saying everything has to be based on Scripture. And the folks in the church are saying, well, there was a time when there was no Scripture, no canon, but there was still a church. So the church, in a sense, precedes Scripture is the argument. And that's the very opposite of the way that Protestants make the argument. Uh, next thing is, look at all these different opinions. You guys want to reform, but you can't even agree among yourselves about what reform should look like. Truth is unitary. Pluralism is error. So they don't want to hold to the idea there can be multiple truths, multiple approaches, et cetera. There's only one, at least in regards to this question. And then, of course, you know, something like the, um, the German Peasants' War, 1525, the Kingdom of Munster and that debacle, 1535. This is just fodder for grist for the mill. Basically, look at what happens when Protestant doctrine gets, a lot, like gets let out into the world. It leads to revolution. It leads to polygamy. Dogs having sex with cats. It's crazy. That was funny. I don't know. I don't know why you're not laughing, but that was maybe you're all just hungry. I'll wrap this up. So this becomes particularly potent after 1525. And to pick up on Ross, your point earlier, their argument is that justification by faith leads to moral laxity because it sounds like it doesn't matter what you do. Um, and you could find some element of that, I suppose. 
I'm not sure that that's what Luther would have wanted, certainly not what Calvin would want, but the way that that's expressed doctrinally. So you can see these are the criticisms that they're starting to develop. And uh, the other major expressions that we could point to, and I'm just going to walk through this and then I think we'll stop, are uh, the creation of the Jesuit order and the Council of Trent. Now, the Council of Trent is probably the most important um, as an expression of reform, but the reason we need to mention the Jesuits is that they become a major player in helping to disseminate reform out into the world. So Ignatius Loyola, uh, you can see his dates here. He is responsible for founding the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits. He proposes this organization in 1540, and it is formally recognized by the Pope in 1558. And basically the Jesuits, what makes them unique is on top of the three typical vows you took to poverty, chastity, and obedience, you took a fourth vow of absolute obedience to the Pope. So it wasn't just that you were obedient to the head of your order, you were now obedient to the Pope. So basically they become an arm of the papal office. And the Pope can dispatch and send them wherever the Pope deems fit. And we see that that happens particularly in two areas, mission and the founding of educational institutions, right? So the first people who talk about themselves as missionaries, basically in the history of the church, are the Jesuits. And they're very explicit in their founding documents, their constitution, that that is part of their function. So before there's ever anything like a Protestant mission, there are Catholic missions going on to China and Japan and India, et cetera. Um, and so they're, they're propagating, right, this vision. And the vision, in a sense, is what they're propagating is what comes out of the Council of Trent. In addition to that, of course, they found all kinds of educational institutions, right? Our own Sarah Wilhelm Garber's got her PhD at Loyola, right? Loyola University in Chicago, named after Ignatius of Loyola. Right? And that's one of many Loyola universities, even in the United States. Now, in addition to that is the Council of Trent. And this is a council that uh, meets for almost 20 years. Not really. They actually wind up getting broken up two or three times, but it takes about 20 years for them to get through everything that they want to do. Uh, calls for a council go back during to the time of Luther when Luther is first sort of um, kind of the ferment around what he wants to do is sort of beginning to bubble up, there are calls from very serious people in the church for a council to help settle some of the issues, to deal with problems having to do with um, indulgences, et cetera. That's not really, they're not able to pull it off politically um, or otherwise until the 1540s. So 1545 to 1563. And it's interrupted multiple times. And I'm not going to go through. I've got some material here because we're running out of time. I don't want to um, delay us any further. But I have provided for you on your outline, on those little um, the citations, uh, a quote both from the Constitution of or the creation of the Jesuits, but then the last big quote is from the Index of Prohibited Books. So the council makes pronouncements about justification by faith in which they reject that idea and say that uh, it, you know, it, justification and sanctification need to happen at the same time. Uh, they talk about scripture and authority in a way that um, highlights and elevates the church's tradition alongside of scripture. They reaffirm the seven sacraments and adopt transubstantiation as the official doctrine of the church, even though it had been in existence for about 300 years. They do not really address papal authority. They just assume it. And the assumption is that the hierarchy of the church is a God-ordained hierarchy, and the pope is supposed to be at the top. Papal supremacy is key. What they do reform... Like in addition to clarifying their positions on all these issues, they do reform the training of clergy. 
and certain practices that had really fueled the anti-clericalism that we talked about before. Remember that at this point in time, um, and maybe we're not quite there anymore, but close to half of all the land in Europe was owned by the church. So they're the landlord. So you can imagine if you're already frustrated about certain things, and then on top of it, you got to pay your rent to you know the church. That would you know cause some serious uh, issues, angst, whatever you want to say. So reforming practices that are particularly focused on the clergy having to do with their education, um, having to do with the idea that they actually have to be present in their diocese and can and actually serve the people that they're supposed to be serving as opposed to just collecting a paycheck. Um, and that each diocese should have a seminary to train their priests. That's all very important. Finally, then, is the index of prohibited books. And that is created during this. And basically, it includes a wide range of both theological and scientific texts that are deemed um, troubling, to say the least. Right, So this is where someone like Galileo and others of that type wind up having some of their, their, their ideas put there. Um, let me skip us ahead to our final assessment. Then. So what can we say? Um, and the last thing I would want to say is that out of the Council of Trent, there's also a call for a new expression, for new expressions in the form of art in particular and music to revitalize the spirituality of the faithful. And basically this is what produces the Baroque age. And so there's a piece up here as you can see um, that's partly inspired by that. So what, what can we say? I think we can say three things about the Council of Trent and, uh, and, and why it's important. First of all, it is a long overdue attempt to reform an ancient institution, right? The ancient church, this, this institution that, you know, it's like trying to move an aircraft carrier, you know. It's going to take a long, long time. So a long overdue process with deep, deep roots, not just something that's trying to respond to Protestant objections. There are other things at stake here that precede that. The second thing that Trent does is it helps to refocus what is going to be the mission of the church in this new world that's coming into being. Like, I haven't been telling you all the other stories that are going on alongside, but this is the time of the rise of nation states. This is the time of the rise of scientific engagement. It's also, of course, the time of the birth of the slave trade and all these things going on you know, taking indigenous lands, all that. How, how is the church going to exist in the midst of that? So concept, reconceptualizing, we might say, the mission of the church and how it understands itself in the world. It's very important from Trent. And one of the most important is probably the centralized role that education is going to begin to take. Remember, we're leaving an age of like... I don't know, 20 to 25% maybe of the population is literate and even less can write. They can read, but maybe they can't write. We're going to go through a period now where the rapid increase, now of course that's made possible in part because of technological advances, but education, educational theory, et cetera, these are all going to become very central to this vision. Okay. Only... 11 minutes over, and you learned so much, so, so much. Thank you. Let me, though, let me stop. Are there comments or questions that you'd like to ask me? Okay, so the Inquisition exists prior to this, but it is retooled and becomes an instrument for sure. Um, the Inquisition has roots, I think, going all the way back to the Albigensian Crusade or the Crusade against the Cathars, which I think is 13th or 14th century. Um, other comments, questions? One more right here from Jeff. Hold on, Jeff. So, th so these two things are kind of going on at the same time. The Catholic Reformation 
and the Protestant Reformation. Yeah, these seven different things, right? Exactly. Yeah. These all these different reform movements. So there's a that's lot right. of turmoil in the Christian tons. church. That's that's right. Tons and tons of turmoil. Uh, and think about it, your own life, right? Think about your own life. When you change, and if you're in a, a period of change, that's typically a period of instability. And um, But what if everyone else around you is also changing? How threatening that might be. How, you know, are, how, how are you going to navigate that? How are you going to protect the change that you think you should be doing over against other people's change and you can kind of understand sort of the sense of the world is literally ending and this is why they called the quote-unquote discovery of North America as the discovery of a new world because the old world was falling apart and they believed this was going to be a new world now I digress I can go into that for ages but um, yes Barbara did you have a comment um, well I was just wondering <clears throat> all these reformers it seems like they still uh, wedge the uh, church organization between the people and God. I mean, they, they just don't trust the Holy Spirit to work. As spoken by a true congregationalist. <clears throat> I mean, I think, obviously, they wouldn't agree, per se, with that. But in terms of the movements we've talked about, the ones that sort of feed into our polity. It's not just Calvin, but it's also that Anabaptist vision where you have, for the first time, a kind of true congregationalism uh, really expressing itself. I'm sure there were probably other movements before, but many of those Anabaptist churches um, functioned in a more congregational f style. But even there, there's still a kind of patriarchy you know, there's still there is still a something of a hierarchy in a lot of those spaces with with a few exceptions so and if you want to read that in the way that you did I'm, I'm sure that's a valid theological critique so I mean this is a time for instance just to, to validate and, and to conclude Vatican II um, which is the great church council of the Roman Catholic Church in the 20th century, that, which goes a long way to really updating the church, finally decides that we're no longer going to identify the church primarily with the institution and the hierarchy, but now with the people. And they begin to adopt language uh, to move in that direction. So they pick up, but it takes a long time. You know, that's 1960s over against the 1540s. So, well, thank you all so much. Remember, next week is going to be a lesson on art, and then the week after we'll come back and I'm going to do a conclusion. I'm going to talk a little bit about the dark side of the Reformation period, um, which I think you've already gotten some of that, but you'll get a little, maybe a little bit more. I won't make it too dark, though, because I don't want you to leave depressed. Uh, so let me uh, say a blessing as we all go forth. Lord, we thank you for uh, this day. We thank you for the grace that you give to us, the opportunity that this time of study and fellowship represents. May we take from it what you want and leave the other parts behind. We ask and pray this now in your name. Amen.